Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Gravitational Waves at Home lecture series organized by the LIGO India's uh, outreach group. Uh, my name is uh, Parameshwar Najit. I am a faculty member at the International Center for Theoretical Sciences of the TIFR in Bangalore. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, thank the LIGO India uh, outreach group for, um, uh, for this very kind invitation to speak to you today. I hope uh, all of you are staying home and following the public health advisory by the uh, health officials. Uh, stay safe. So uh, today's uh, lecture, um, I'm going to give a summary of the uh, tests of general relativity that um, we have been doing using the observations of gravitational waves. Um, so let me start um, with the statement that Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity is the most accurate theory of gravity available to us right now. It is uh, one of the cornerstones of modern physics. So we take it as granted for most of the time, but it's a very important thing. It's a basic tenet of science that we always re-verify our basic assumptions. So in this sense, testing the validity of our fundamental assumptions, fundamental theories is a basic nature of basic, uh, basic tenet of, of, of modern science. So in this sense, uh, people have been so, you know, uh, putting the theory to test uh, by a variety of laboratory experiments and, and astrophysical tests, and gravitational wave observations provide the, the latest in this, in this uh, test birds. So uh, coming back to GR, Einstein's theory is the most accurate theory of gravity available to us now. Let me spend a couple of minutes explaining this. Uh, this is a radical departure from the earlier theory of gravity that um, uh, Newton proposed uh, uh, 300 years ago. Um, so according to Einstein's theory, gravity is not a force, but it is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time, and it is produced by all kinds of mass distributions as well as energy and momentum content in the space-time. So in the absence of any, any, uh, any concentrations of energy or mass, space-time is completely flat. But any massive object, like an apple, would curve the space-time around it. Uh, it's very hard to imagine uh, this, this, this object called space-time. It, is, it, is, uh, it has four dimensions, three dimensions of space, and the fourth dimension is time. So uh, it is harder to imagine the curvature of, of space-time. But really, the interesting thing is that one could make local measurements to infer the curvature of space-time. For example, in the absence of any curvature, in the absence of, of far away from any massive object, the space-time is completely flat. This means that all the usual axioms of Euclidean geometry that we learn from school are valid there. For example, if you draw a triangle and add the angles inside the triangle, it will add up to 180 degrees. Uh, similarly, if you take the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of a circle, it's a constant called the pi. But as you approach the vicinity of massive object or massive concentrations of energy, these usual axioms of Euclidean geometry will not be valid. For example, if you draw a triangle, it will and add the angles inside the triangle, it will not add up to 180 degrees. So one could actually do a local measurement to verify whether the prediction of GR is correct or not. So it, it sounds very exotic uh, because you, you invoke this idea of completely um, un- um, and unimaginable un, un, un things like, like space-time and curved space-time. But the really important thing about um, uh, you know, any, any theories of, of modern physics is that it has to make testable predictions, which one could go and verify using experiments and observations. And uh, Einstein had a set of data that needed explanation, uh, explanation uh, even before he constructed the theory. 
And this was basically the orbit of the innermost planet of the solar system, the Mercury. We know that all, almost all planets in the solar system uh, orbit the, the sun in, in, in elliptical orbits. But interestingly, Mercury does not follow a closed elliptical orbit. Mercury's orbital ellipse precesses, as shown in this cartoon. And uh, astronomers over a few hundred centuries have acquired enough accurate observational data to make precise measurements of, of this, what is called the orbital precession. Indeed, most of this orbital precession is caused by the fact that this is not a purely a two-body system. Uh, other massive planets in the solar system, such as the Jupiter and Saturn, etc., add perturbations to this two-body system, including the Sun and the Mercury. And most of the precession is caused by these gravitational perturbations induced by the other massive planets. But it turned out that even if you accounted for all these uh, gravitational perturbations, there is a, um, a, a, a part, a fraction of the precession that, that cannot be explained by all these theories, all this theory and, and the gravitational perturbation of, uh, of all the other planets in, in Newtonian theory. And Einstein's theory, if you solve the uh, orbital equations using Einstein's theory, it uh, it explained the observational data remarkably well. So this was the, the, the first success that the Einstein's theory um, uh, accomplished. So Einstein's theory, apart from uh, explaining the existing, um, uh, some of the observational puzzles, made some very, very interesting predictions, which are completely uh, very, very unique. One is that since we know that light travels through straight lines, and that's because the shortest distance between two points in a flat space is a straight line. But if the space-time is curved, it turned out that light follows the, the so-called geodesics of this curved space-time. Geodesics are basically paths, the closest paths connecting two points in a, in a general space-time, which are not straight lines. So you can actually think of a, a, an astrophysical, astronomical manifestation of, of, of this bending of light. So imagine you are viewing the rays of a star that is grazing the limb of the sun. The sun is bit in between the observer and the, and the source. And because the, the starlight passes through the curved space time that is curved by the sun, it basically follows the geodesic of that curved space-time. And this means that an observer who is viewing the, sun, the, the star from the other side of the sun would see an apparent shift in the position of the star. And according to GR, this can be calculated very precisely because we know the mass of the sun. And uh, a British a team led by uh, the British uh, physicist astronomer Arthur Eddington verified this prediction during the total solar eclipse on 29th May 1919. And we basically celebrated the centenary year of this uh, remarkable observation by Eddington and his team uh, last year. There was a lot of celebration. I hope some of you are also part of it. And the, the right the uh, photograph here is an actual photographic play taken by uh, the, the team led by uh, Eddington. And, and if you close, if you, if, you, if you look very, very carefully, you could see some, uh, some stars in this photograph also. But since it's rather difficult, I have made a cartoon version of, of what uh, Eddington observed. So there is a cartoon sun here. And the... Um, Red stars are the position of the stars that Eddington observed during the total solar eclipse. And what they did was after several months, when the same star cluster was in the night sky, they observed the position of the stars in the night sky. So that is when the sun was not in between us and the, and the stars. And that is shown by the blue stars. And you can see that during the eclipse, the position of the stars have shifted. And more importantly, the closer the star's position uh, was to the sun, the larger is the shift. And, and you could also calculate the amount of uh, shift 
in the apparent position of the of, of the location of, of the stars using Einstein's theory, and these observations match the, uh, the, the theory uh, remarkably well. And this really made um, um, uh, this one of the, the first remarkable um, uh, independent verification of Einstein's theory, which made Einstein a celebrity uh, overnight uh, worldwide. And now this this is called the gravitational bending of light. And it's a very commonplace phenomena in astronomy um, these days. In fact, we see much more dramatic versions of, of this light bending, gravitational light bending. And this is called gravitational lenses, uh, in which gravity is so strong that it basically focuses light rays, uh, thus acting like a lens. And on the right side uh, is, a, is a cartoon diagram that, that uh, illustrates this idea. So here, um, there is a, a background galaxy, which is uh, the, the luminous one in, in the, at the end of the plot, and uh, the Earth on the other end. And there is another massive galaxy that is shown as this little sphere in between the source and the observer, which creates a large curvature in the space time. And the light rays follow that, that geodesics of the curved space time. And the light gets focused because of the gravitational bending of, of light. And as a result, we get, we get to see multiple images of the same galaxy that is shown by these luminous little um, ellipses. And while this uh, right-hand side was a, was a cartoon, on the left-hand side uh, is a real photograph taken by the Hubble telescope. So you see the remarkable arc-like uh, luminous object which is basically a gravitationally lensed galaxy that is sitting behind this um, luminous uh, galaxy cluster that is sitting uh, in the middle. So basically, this background galaxy and the gravitational lens and us form a line of sight. So there is a symmetry axis. The lights come from all directions and, and forms a ring-like image. And this is called the um, Einstein ring. So such, such uh, observations are, are very common in, in modern astronomy these days. And not only these Einstein's predictions have been verified with remarkable accuracy, but gravitational lensing has become a, an independent, powerful tool for, for uh, probing uh, cosmic structures like distribution of dark matter in the, in the universe. Uh, Einstein's theory also makes a number of very interesting other predictions. One is that gravity affects the flow of time. Uh, for example, if you have uh, two identical clocks, one um, sitting directly on the surface of the Earth and another in space several hundreds of kilometers away, then uh, it turns out that the one that is closest to the Earth would run slightly slower as compared to the one that is in free space in the absence of any gravitational field. And this has been first verified by a remarkable experiment uh, in the 1960s done by Pound and Drebka where they verified that the gravitational time dilation can be measured even when the clocks are separated by a few uh, tens of meters. And uh, now there are much more accurate measurements of this, this effect of gravitational time dilation. Not only that, uh, a lot of us use this as part of more modern technology these days. So I guess uh, a lot of us use uh, Google Maps and mobile phones. And uh, uh, so if you want to locate yourself uh, in a map, Basically, you have to know the location in the map, right? And this is done by uh, a system called the Global Positioning System currently, which forms a, a system of satellites, about 30 satellites, uh, orbiting around the, around the Earth. And they form a very nice coordinate system related to which we can make measurements of time delays. Uh, and if you know the uh, time delays between at least three uh, such satellites, we can triangulate ourselves in three-dimensional space. That's the idea. So each of these satellites have a very precise atomic clock on board. And they broadcast the time measured by these atomic clocks as, as radio pulses. And uh, these GPS receivers basically try to receive the radio pulses from at least three or more uh, such satellites to triangulate ourselves on the three-dimensional space. And um, these are very precise atomic clocks with accuracy of you know, a part in 10 to the 15 or so, or even better. And all of these have been synchronized before they were put in the spacecraft. But now they are orbiting the Earth several hundreds of kilometers away from the Earth. 
and they feel a different gravitational field as compared to the same clock on the earth this means that the clocks on the uh, on on board these satellites would tick slightly faster than the same clock on the earth and one has to account for this difference between the clocks um on the on the satellite and and the on the earth the difference is very small something like the accumulated time shift is something like 1 nanosecond per day but if you did not take this into account that is this error is sufficient to screw up our uh, uh, localization accuracy in a matter of few minutes so the gps receivers actually take this into account when it uh, uh, triangulate uh, ourselves in this three dimensional space so these exotic predictions of einstein's theory have not only been verified but has become part of our uh, modern technology now there are many other interesting predictions one is the existence of black holes this is uh, first discovered by the german mathematician and physicist astronomer uh, karl schwarzschild uh, who uh, found that you can solve einstein's equations for a spherically symmetric system um, uh, and this is now called the schwarzschild solution and uh, essentially it, it uh, implies that if any object that has a mass m is concentrated been uh, crushed to form a radius of 2 gm by c square it form a very strange uh, surface called the black hole horizon and this black hole horizon has this property that things can only go into it and nothing can come out of it and even light um einstein was you know if, uh, einstein was very very impressed by this 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 fact that this mathematician and, and physicist called schwarzschild solved his um, field equations and first uh, found an exact solution to it but neither einstein nor schwarzschild could have believed that this would correspond to uh, actual object that we find in the universe but now we know that black holes are not only just mathematical concepts black holes are ubiquitous in the universe um and, and uh, for example there have been enormous astronomical evidence suggesting that black holes of different sizes and different masses exist very very commonly in the universe for example the the animation that we see on this left uh is an observation that was taken by the uh, the, the the UCLA group over the last couple decade or so at the galactic center what you see here are the motions of some stars about a dozen stars around some central dark object you can see that some of them actually form close ellipses and many of the other stars are in the process of uh, forming ellipses and uh, around some unseen dark object but by looking at the um, the orbital properties of these stars one could infer the mass of the central object just like we measure the mass of the sun from the orbits of planets it turns out to be about 4 million solar masses about 4 million times the mass of the sun so there is a huge concentration of of mass that is centered around a very compact region of space at, at the center of our galaxy and our only explanation is that this is a black hole And, and now and last year we heard this fantastic news made by this uh, even horizon telescope which made an actual uh, radio image of the shadow created by the central black hole of another neighboring galaxy that is not our, our own galaxy but something that is uh, very very massive so and uh, we are at this point waiting for a similar picture of of the shadow of our own galactic uh, central black hole uh made by the same team of scientists from the event horizon telescope there are also uh while these are supermassive black holes of million millions of solar masses there are also uh black holes of stellar masses which have masses of of the order of 10 solar mass or 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 or, or so and there are uh something like 100 millions of such 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 black holes estimated to be in our own galaxy uh for example there is this bright x-ray host uh, called the cygnus x1 and uh, this uh, is uh, believed to host a very uh, uh, massive black hole uh, several times the mass of the sun and a, a, so this is in in a, in a in a binary orbit with another massive donor star and the black hole basically accretes gas from this donor star which heats up and produces hot 
uh, hot uh, X-rays, and which is which is emitting these X-rays. So there are um, very strong observational evidence that black holes of 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 a variety of masses in solar masses and supermassive black uh, supermassive uh, uh, black holes of, of of million types millions of solar masses to billions of solar masses exist in the universe. Um, there are postulates uh, of the existence of intermediate mass black holes of of several hundreds of solar masses also, and we don't have a very strong evidence of them yet. So the last intriguing observational prediction that was verified by a direct observation um, uh, uh, was the existence of gravitational waves. And um, gravitational waves are, again, a, a, a solutions of, of, of um, Einstein's uh, field equations. They are uh, wave-like solutions of, of, of the linearized equations of Einstein's theory of GR. And uh, if you want to physically imagine them, they can be thought of as oscillations in space-time geometry that propagate at the speed of light. And Einstein's theory also predicts that any, any uh, time-varying mass distributions with a time-varying quadrupole moment, with an accelerating quadrupole moment, would produce these ripples in space-time that propagate at the speed of light. And even prior to the direct detection of gravitational waves by LIGO and, and Virgo that all of you are aware of, we did have a very strong evidence that gravitational waves do exist in the universe. And these came from the radio observations of binary pulsars, which provided a really remarkable uh, um, uh, test bed for Einstein's theory in the last several decades. So just remind yourself, pulsars in the left floor shows a cartoon of a pulsar. Uh, a pulsars are highly magnetized, neut magnetized neutron stars. And this very high magnetic field accelerate charged particles and collimate them to a beam of, of, of uh, charged particles, which, you know, which in turn radiates to, to produce electromagnetic radiation. And these neutron stars are typically rapidly spinning. They are spinning their own axis several times, several tens of times per second. Uh, they are um, frequencies of, 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 of uh, hundreds of hertz or tens of hertz. And in general, the rotation axis is misaligned with the axis of the, the magnetic uh, uh, field, which means that because of this beam is highly collimated, we would see this emission only when this beam is directed towards us. So, and because it's rapidly rotating, uh, we see regular pulses of radiation. And uh, one remarkable thing about these pulsars is that their orbital frequencies are remarkably stable. They are, if you average over several pulses, then they are remarkably good clocks. With, they have much better precision as compared to any, any optical or atomic clocks that we have made uh, by our own technology. And now binary pulsars are binary systems consisting of pulsars, where uh, the companion of the pulsar could be another neutron star or a white dwarf and, and so on. So if you're able to see these radio pulses, from at least one of the neutron stars, we can time them very precisely, which means that we can measure the orbital properties very, very well. For example, we could measure how the orbital frequency is changing as a function of time over the period of several years. Interestingly, binary pulsars, they are two, two, typically two neutron stars, and each of those neutron stars have mass comparable to the mass of the Earth. The radius comparable to a, a city, like 20 kilometers or 10 kilometers radius. So what you have is an extremely compact concentrations of mass, which are orbiting each other with very large velocities, speeds something like uh, 1,000 of the speed of light. And what we have is a pretty strong source of gravitational waves. And the system loses energy into gravitational waves. And as a result, it comes closer and closer because it loses the orbital energy. And as the orbit orbital separation decreases, the orbital frequency increases, which produce more and more gravitational waves. And as a result, the orbital separation decreases even faster. So even though we have not directly measured from the gravitational waves from our binary pulsars in our own galaxy, because they happen to be in too low a frequency band, we don't have any detectors yet, we have seen its effect of gravitational waves on the orbital frequency of the pulsar itself. So 
for example, this, this plot is a, is a remarkable plot made by something like three decades of radio observations of a binary pulsar system that is popularly called the Hulse-Taylor binary, named after the people who discovered it, Hulse and Taylor. So on the horizontal axis is a year starting from 1970s, which is before uh, most of us were born. And it goes all the way up to uh, early 2000s. And what we see on the, on the, in the vertical axis is a cumulative shift in the time of periastone, which is a measure of the orbital period of the system. So if you call it uh, the first point as zero, the, the next, uh, all these black dot lines are actual radio measurements of the change in the orbital period of the system. And you can see that the orbital period is decreasing over, uh, over this uh, last few decades. And the line here is not a fit to the data, but it's a true prediction from Einstein's theory because we can measure the mass of the system and it's at this eccentricity, orbital eccentricity, et cetera. We can calculate the amount of the change in the orbital period of the system due to the emission of gravitational radiation. And that predicted value, which is in, in this sort of little equation called PB dot GR, agrees with the measured value, which is the PB dot, within something like a fractional percent accuracy. So it's, it's a remarkable verification that gravitational waves did exist and, it's a, and, and, and they behave very well within uh, what predicted by Einstein's theory. So what has been happening in the last couple of decades is an international effort, a quest for the direct detection of gravitational waves that are passing through the Earth. And these have been um, led by the last decades, uh, a couple of decades, by uh, ground-based interferometric gravitational wave detectors like the LIGO observatories in the USA and the Virgo observatory in, 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 um, in, in Europe, as well as the GEO in, in Germany and, and, and TAMA in Japan, and et cetera. And we know that now that there are gravitational observatories coming up in India, or LIGO India, and in Japan called Kagra, et cetera. So, uh, so these, the initial versions of these interferometric observatories have been operating from the early 2000s itself. But what has happened in the, in the last few years is that they basically upgraded to what is called the advanced configurations, which means that they have sensitivities like a factor of 10 better than uh, their uh, previous generation counterparts. And as long, as soon as uh, these observatories, in particular the advanced LIGO detectors started operating, they detected the first gravitational wave signal. So this happened on the 14th of September, 2015. And uh, the first uh, signal was um, produced by the merger of two black holes, uh, two massive black holes, each weighing about 30 times the mass of the sun, colliding with each other in a very distant galaxy about 1.3 billion light years away. And what is shown here is a, it's a very simple uh, time frequency representation of the data from these detectors after a very simple processing of the data. So in the x-axis is a time in seconds, and the y-axis has two, like a superimposed two things. One is that uh, it's a frequency of the, of, the, of the signal. So that is the background. So you can see some chirp-like signals. You can see the frequency increasing as a function of time. This is a very characteristic nature of chirping signals. And also plotted uh, on, on top of it is the time series of the observed data um, uh, after a very simple uh, band passing of the data. So you could see this uh, characteristic signal that has an increasing frequency, increasing frequency and an increasing amplitude. This is called a chirping signal, which is followed by a peak and an exponential fall off, which is called the ring down. And this is the data observed by the two LIGO observatories located at the two corners of the United States of America, separated by about 3,000 kilometers. They are very independent detectors. So the fact that we have observed the same signal in two detectors that are separated by about 3,000 kilometers gave enormous confidence um, that this is a true signal. Um, and this is what is called a five sigma discovery, which is considered as the golden standard uh, in, in physics. Of course, this is not the only signal that LIGO and Virgo has detected. Um, uh, in the first two observing runs that happened in 2015 and, 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 and 17, for several months, LIGO and Virgo has, um, have observed about a dozen uh, of, 
compact binary coalescences, 10 confident detections of the coalescence of binary black holes, and one coincident, uh, um, uh, confident detection of the merger of two neutron stars, which was observed not only by the, the LIGO and Virgo observatories through gravitational waves, but the electromagnetic counterparts of this merger, this very interesting exotic phenomena, was detected by hundreds of telescopes across the frequency band, starting from gamma rays all the way up to radio um, across the globe as well as space. So it's a remarkable multi-messenger discovery of a merger of uh, two neutron stars. And if you compare this, uh, so this in, in this 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 shows uh, like a like a demographics of the uh, of the these compact objects that LIGO and Virgo has discovered during their first observing runs. So each of these plots shows one merger. This blue blue dots, for example. So two black holes merge to form a more massive black hole. That is that is that is the meaning of of these uh, these 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 plots. And if you look at, uh, I mentioned that. We do have a very strong uh, indirect evidence of, of, of black holes through X-ray observations, like the Cygnus X1. But it turns out that, and, and these are shown by these purple circles, it's called EM black holes, the legend EM black holes. And if you compare the mass distribution of, of these black holes with what we discovered from gravitational observations, uh, uh, it turns out that they have fairly different characteristics. So just to remind you that the vertical axis shows the mass of the object in, in units of solar masses. So typically, you would see that the mass of the X-ray black holes have masses between 5 and 10 solar masses, while most of the LIGO black holes are much more massive, about more than 10 or no, 20 solar masses. So, so it, it was, in fact, a surprise that LIGO detected these um, uh, the such massive black holes because um, astronomers did not really expect the existence of such massive stellar mass black holes in the universe until LIGO made this discovery. On the other hand, the, the, the neutron stars that, that LIGO and Virgo has observed are more or less consistent with the binary pulsars and, and the pulsars that uh, we have detected in the galaxy most of the time, even though the latest discovery of the binary binary neutron star merger that uh, LIGO and Virgo has announced earlier this year have, has uh, possibly masses that are um, larger than, than, uh, than a vanilla neutron star that we know from uh, our own galaxy. Um, I should also add that these are not the only signals that LIGO and Virgo has detected. Uh, several groups have made independent analysis of the data and have made uh, more detections that are weaker signals that have been not that are sort of left out by the LIGO analysis and have and 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 have discovered the signal that are quite weak using more sophisticated and improved data analysis techniques. And in the ongoing third observing run of LIGO, there are about 50 candidate signals have been detected. And uh, in, in the third observing run, uh, the alerts of the detection of such signals are, are made um, uh, known to the public in, in near real time. And we know that there are you know, more than 50 candidate gravitational signals that, that uh, LIGO and Virgo has observed during the, uh, during the uh, last the, the observing run, which has just come concluded in March. Uh, and the, this data is being analyzed for uh, confirming that at least a good fraction of them are real events. And the, the latest news is, 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 the, uh, is the detection, the confirmed detection of a binary black hole system, which is a bit name of GW190412, which means that it, is, it basically happened on, on the April 12th of 2019. And this paper has been just published two days ago. And uh, this is uh, a signal produced by the merger of a binary black hole system with fairly asymmetric masses. For example, the, the more massive object has a mass of about 30 times the mass of the sun, and the less massive object has a mass of about eight times the mass of the sun. And this merger happened at a distance of about 700 megaparsec. And you can see the, the time frequency plots, the signal which shows this characteristic uh, chirping pattern. And we will hear more about this event in an upcoming GW at Home talk by Professor Anand Sengupta from IIT Gandhinagar. 
So I will. Um, that's all I will say about uh, about these events. So let me now come to the real topic of this lecture, which is that gravitational wave observations provide an exciting test, a new test bed for general relativity. So you might ask, why testing GR more? Because we know that GR has been tested and tested in a variety of laboratory experiments and um, and, and, and astronomical observations uh, a gazillion times. So the remarkable thing is that other tests have probed the validity of GR in the regime of weak gravitational fields and slow motions. So here this shows a, some kind of a landscape of, uh, of various astrophysical as well as laboratory tests of GR. In the uh, X axis, the horizontal axis, uh, it plot the gravitational potential in units of C square. And using the Virial theorem, if for self-gravitating system, the gravitational potential is basically equal to the speed square of the system also. So it's V by C square also, it's equal to the same thing. So you can see that the left means it's very slow motions or weak gravitational fields. And the right side means very fast motions and very strong gravitational fields. And one means speed of light C. And the vertical axis shows the curvature scale, which is uh, mass divided by the length cube square root. So this means that larger mass systems provide less curvature. The curvature sc uh, scale is uh, uh, longer, and less massive systems provide larger curvature. So it's, you could imagine that uh, a black hole that is uh, much less massive provides uh, a much stronger curvature scale as compared to a, a supermassive black hole, which has a curvature of scale of um, uh, length of much longer, um, about you know, millions of kilometers. And, and you can place these various tests uh, uh, in this parameter space. For example, the perihelion precision of Mercury probes the V by C square of, of the order of 10 to the minus 8, which means that the V by C is of the order of 10 to the minus 4. So the, the Mercury speed is something like a 1, one in 10,000 of the speed of light. And uh, double pulsar or the binary pulsar systems probe an order of magnitude larger speeds, like V by C is of, of the order of 10 to the minus 3, so 1,000 the speed of light. While gravitational wave observations by LIGO, because they are, but we are seeing the inspiral of black holes during their last stages, their orbital speeds are close to the speed of light. And the curvature scales are of the order of tens of kilometers. So, the gravitational uh, probes of, of LIGO and Virgo are basically in the extreme top right corner of this parameter space, which is not probed by any experiment so far. So the next plot shows, again, uh, a real, me you know, a real uh, measured or inferred velocity of black holes from gravitational signals. So this is from the first LIGO discovery paper. So the horizontal axis is a time in units of seconds. And on the top corner, we show a cartoon of the in spiral of two black holes. We have two black holes orbiting each other at large separations. Because of the gravitational emission, it loses energy, come closer and closer, spirals in, eventually merges to form a single deformed black hole, and the, which basically uh, oscillates in the form of so-called quasi-normal modes before they, it, it settles into a stationary rotating black hole described by the so-called Kerr solution in general relativity. The next plot is the gravitation wave signal produced by such a merger as computed by Einstein's theory. And the bottom plot is that you know, by looking at the frequency evolution of the signal, you can actually get a pretty good estimate of the velocity of the black holes before they merge. So you see this, this green uh, trace is the velocity of black holes in units of C. So you can see that it goes from about 0.3 C to uh, 0.6 C. So it's a good fraction of the speed of light, more than, you know, it reaches, before they emerge, these, these black holes uh, move with speeds close to the speed of light. And similarly, the black uh, uh, trace shows the orbital separation in units of short child radius. So you can also see that they come to separations as close to this, these, like, you know, twice the short child radius. So they are extremely relativistic and massive and compact systems. It's, a, it's an excellent testing uh, ground for theories of gravity. So just like 
if you want to test standard model of particle physics, you collide particles with extreme velocities. If you want to test Einstein's theory, the best way is to test collide black holes with extreme velocities. You have this relativistic, compact, massive object that are colliding with very, very high speeds. So if you see some violation of GR, this is where you should expect. So that's why we need to test. Uh, that's why gravitational observations are a particularly appealing, um, you know, testing ground for Einstein's theory. So let me just give you a summary of, of, uh, of the gravitational wave based tests of, of GR using the LIGO Virgo observations. So I should first add the detection of gravitational waves that are broadly consistent with GR itself is a remarkable prediction of GR. But it does not mean that GR is the correct theory because you could construct theories that, that basically mimic a lot of properties of GR. So if you want to see the differences, it has to be very, very fine. The difference has to be you know, seen in, in, in fine details. But unfortunately, um, you know, the, the alternative theories are in a much primitive stage as compared to Einstein's theory. And there are not many reliable predictions of how the gravitational waves look like in alternative theories produced by the merger of two black holes or a compact objects, et cetera. So in the absence of reliable predictions or reliable models of the waveform, expected signals in alternative theories, the current philosophy is to test how well the data is consistent with the predictions of GR and, and of black holes in GR, for example. So people have proposed and, and implemented a number of tests, which are you know, like signal consistency tests, tests of gravitational wave generation and propagation, how the waveforms are generated and, and propagated in space, and the nature of gravitational wave polarizations, the probes of black hole horizons, et cetera. So let me give you a, a brief um, a hint of, 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 of these tests. So one very simple test and the most model agnostic test that we can do is the following. So we know that the data consists of a true signal plus noise. And we can get a best estimate of the underlying signal by you know, comparing the data with various signal models, et cetera. And we can subtract the best fit data, sorry, best fit template, best fit signal waveform from the data. And if the template or the signal model is a good description of the true underlying signal, the residual after subtracting the best fit template from the data should be consistent with pure noise. So this is what the so-called residual test is. And basically, then you can check how well this, the residual is consistent with noise in, in neighboring segments of data where we know that the noise does not contain any signal. And uh, this is a, you can, you know, you can do a, you can formulate this in a fairly sophisticated uh, status, statistical means and, and ask how often do you get um, um, uh, a, a noise induced residual in the data that is set, that mimics signal, et cetera. So you can construct a compute a signal to noise ratio in this in this residual data and ask how well it is consistent with data with, with pure noise. And such an observation, such a test has been done on, on, on the events. And uh, the summary is that we do not see any, any significant evidence of residual power after subtracting the best fit template. So the data seems to be consistent with GR. Another interesting test that you can do is. Uh, is the following. In the case of the binary black hole coalescence, we know that the part of the signal is produced by the in spiral of the two black holes and the subsequent merger. And the last part of the signal is produced by the oscillations of this newly formed merged remnant black hole. And we can split the data into parts that are produced by the in spiral of the two black hole and produced by the post-merger oscillations of the signal of the, of the black hole. And we can extract the properties of the black holes or the binary from the part of the signal that are produced by the in spiral of the two black holes. And using Einstein's theory, using simulations, using numerical relativity calculations, you can predict what would be the mass and the spin angular momentum of the remnant black hole. 
The idea is that you, you measure the masses and the spins of the black hole that are in the binary, and we can calculate the amount of energy and angle amount that is radiated through gravitational waves. You can subtract the energy radiated into gravitational waves from the total mass of the system, and that gives you the mass of the remnant black hole. Similarly, you can subtract the angular momentum radiated into gravitational waves from the total angular momentum of the binary, and that gives you the remnant spin angular momentum of the remnant black hole. So you can make a prediction of the mass and the spin of the remnant black hole without actually looking at the part of the signal produced by the remnant black hole. That is shown by this plot here. This is the mass and the spin of the um, remnant black hole. And these contours are the probability regions, about 90% confidence regions of the probability of the posterior probability, which is the conditional probability that given the data, uh, what these values of mass and spin takes. Uh, and the one that is taken, you know, that is produced from the inspiral part is shown by this um, legend called inspiral. And, and then you can look at the part of the signal produced by the post merger part and make the same estimate. It's an independent path of data, and you're going to get an independent estimate of the mass and the spin of the remnant black hole from the post in spiral signal. And if all our ingredients are consistent, if the theory is consistent, then these two different estimates have to be consistent with each other. They have to have an overlapping region. And this is what we see indeed. So again, we see no inconsistency of the data with the prediction of GR. You can also do some parameterized tests. These are uh, motivated by the kind of tests that people do using radio observations of binary pulsars. So here the idea is that um, we know the expected shape of the signal in a semi-analytical way by using the so-called post-Newtonian theory. So you can solve the Einstein's equations using an approximation technique called post-Newtonian theory. And you can also uh, marry it with numerical entry calculations to, to, to get the full in spiral merger part, et cetera. But you know, just for simplicity, let's focus on the in spiral part of the signal, which is accurately given by a post-Newtonian expansion of the Einstein's equations. So here the idea is that the phase of the signal as a function of Fourier frequency can be written as a series which have different powers of the Fourier frequency. And these coefficients, which are written here, the psi of f is a, is a series in, in different powers of the Fourier frequency, is small f. And these pi's are the coefficients of different powers of Fourier frequency. And given the masses and the spins of the black holes, these pi's are given uniquely by Einstein's theory. But now, you can treat them as free parameters. So you, you introduce certain deviations parameters on this PI, so called delta PI, and estimate its value along with the masses and the spins, et cetera, from the data. And if the data is consistent with GR, we expect that these delta PIs should be consistent with zero, because that is the rare value in, 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 in zero. And these plots show these posterior probabilities of these parameters that we extracted from the data. And summary, all of them are consistent with zero. So again, we do not see any evidence of deviation from GR from these signals. You can also do, uh, and, and, and interestingly, this is a very um, uh, theory agnostic test. For example, you're treating all these parameters as, as free parameters, et cetera. But it turns out that different alternative theories predict different specific values of this parameter. So if you put an upper bound on some of these parameters, you can you can interpret them in the context of specific theories. And for example, you can rule out the parameter space, allowed parameter space of certain theories, or you can completely rule them out also. You can also, so while this is, this, um, these deformation effects are mostly related to how the gravitational waves are generated in modified theories, but not only restricted that. You can also have gravitational waves have different properties while they propagate through space-time. For example, we know that according to Einstein's theory, gravitational waves travel at speed of light, and they suffer no dispersion. But you could imagine, in some other theories, um, um, the gravitational waves are dispersive, and, and people have proposed such theories. So you can 
write down. So this means that different frequency components of the signal would travel at different speeds. And in the case of a chirping binary, as we have seen, it contains a range of frequencies because they start with slow frequencies, eventually moving much faster and faster. There's a high frequency component also. And these different frequency components would travel at different speeds, which would mean that the observed waveform at the end would, have, would be deformed from the original waveform. So you can introduce such phenomenological deviations in the dispersion relation and constrain its their coefficients. And, and again, there are uh, particular um, uh, 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 forms of this, this, this changes in dispersion relation correspond to particular theories. For example, you could constrain the mass of the hypothetical particle graviton um, uh, using such you know, upper limits on the dispersion. So for example, so to summarize, uh, there is the analysis has shown that there is no evidence of dispersion in the gravitational signals. So we can put an upper limit on the dispersion amount of dispersion that we see in the gravitational waves, which you can use to put constraints on specific theories. For example, a theory that predicts a massive graviton. A graviton, as you know, we is a is a is a proposed quantum particle of gravity, and we have no measurement of that. We have no not really any, any satisfactory theory of quantum gravity also. But if such a particle exists, because it, it should happen if there is a quantum theory of gravity, it has to be massless, just like the photon, because it travels at the speed of light. Now, if on the other hand, the graviton were massive, it would uh, then this would have a non-trivial dispersion relation, and it would cause a dispersion of the observed signal. And this lack of dispersion can be used to constrain the mass of graviton. And, and these gravitational observations have enabled us to put some of the best upper limits on the mass of graviton. Uh, gravitational observations of the binary neutron star system that I mentioned, along with the simultaneous observation of the gamma ray burst, this is the 170817 signal. Uh, have allowed us to do some really, really interesting measurements in a very, very simple way. So here, the idea is that what we have observed is a gravitational wave signal and a gamma ray signal, the time delay of about 1.7 seconds. And these, both these signals were produced possibly near simultaneously. It's uh, maybe at, at max a, you know, a few seconds delay. And they have been traveling for this hundreds of millions of light years, about 100 million light years, keeping their relative arrival times almost the same. So the fact that these gamma rays and gravitational waves arrived almost the same time have allowed us to put a, a very stringent um, uh, measurement of the speed of gravitational waves as compared to the speed of light. Now we know that. The, diff, the gravitational waves should travel at the speed of light uh, within a possible error bar of less than 10 to the minus 15. And this very simple measurement has ruled out a large number of alternative theories that people have invoked to explain the accelerated expansion of the universe. It's a major puzzle, as, as most of you know. And one possible explanation of this is this, this vacuum energy or dark energy. And another possible explanation is that uh, Einstein's theory, uh, gravity behaves differently from Einstein's theory at large scales. And there is a whole um, industry of creating alternative theories to explain these observed accelerator expansion of the universe. And this very simple measurement has constrained a parameter space of a, a, a large fraction of a significant fraction of these alternative theories. And there, there are some really um, you know, sort of fun things one could do as well. One is that uh, you could constrain the possibility of extra dimensions using the observations of gravitational waves. So here is the idea that if there are non-compact extra dimensions, these are not the ones that are predicted by string theory, et cetera. But we know that uh, you know, currently our space time has four dimensions. But if there are non-compact extra dimensions, then according to certain theories, Gravitational waves would leak through these extra dimensions also, while the electromagnetic radiation would only propagate to our own four-dimensional space-time. This means that if you have a system 
that produces both electromagnetic radiation as well as gravitational radiation. Then the gravitational wave, some of the gravitational waves would be lost to the extra dimension, while all of the electromagnetic radiation will be seen in our four dimensional space time. And this means that if you make distance estimate based on measurement of the gravitational radiation as well as the electromagnetic radiation, these two different, est different estimates of distance would differ. And the fact that we have two independent measurements of distance to this binary infrastructure merger from the electromagnetic radiation as well as gravitational radiation have enabled us to constrain the number of space-time non-compact non space-time dimensions to be four, which so is consistent with our um, current understanding of gravity. Uh, you can also do some other tests of, 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 of gravitational waves themselves, uh, because according to Einstein's theory, gravitational waves contain two polarization modes, so-called tensor modes, so-called H plus and H cross. Now, there are alternative theories that, that predict the existence of other polarization modes. In general, gravitation waves could have up to six polarization modes, like two scalar modes, two vector modes, in addition to the two tensor modes that quadrupolar patterns that Einstein's theory predict. And if we have a sufficient number of detectors, we could, you know, each detector, of course, measure only a linear combination of these polarizations. But if we have many, detectors that are differently oriented. We could measure different combinations of these six polarizations and, and check whether the gravitation waves contain polarization modes other than the tensor modes that Einstein predicted. Um, this test has been done to some level using current observations, but not to great accuracy. The reason is that we have only three detectors operating so far. And even among them, the two LIGO detectors have a very similar orientation. This means that they observe the same linear combinations of the polarizations. They are linearly dependent. And uh, we, do, we cannot extract the polarization content very, very accurately. But with the advanced detector network expanding in the next few years, in particular with LIGO India and Kagra, we have more and more detectors um, joining these, these international network of detectors which will allow us to disentangle these correlations much better and to, to test some, do some of this, this, this tests of the nature of gravitational waves much better in the next several years. Uh, finally, uh, I want to say a couple of things about the, 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 the nature of black holes themselves, because that, that's again, black holes are some kind of fundamental objects in Einstein's theory. And according to Einstein's theory, the perturbed, a, a black hole that if you perturb would, would go back to its stationary state by emitting uh, characteristic radiation modes, which are called quasi-normal modes. They are similar to normal, normal modes of our usual solids, etc., but with an exponential damping, so called quasi-normal modes. And uh, if you, you know, this, you know, this, this has been uh, uh, verified really well in, in theory, because if you compare the the gravitational waves that we compute using numerical simulations of binary black holes, and if you look at the late path that are produced by the ringing of the merged black hole, and if you compare this with calculations of the black hole perturbation theory, they agree very well. That is shown by this, this plot. But now we do have an opportunity to, to measure, to check whether the, the late part of the merger of two black holes, the ring down of these two black holes, um, contain the presence of quasi normal modes. And such tests have been done using the, the LIGO data, in particular using the first observing, uh, first uh, binary black hole event. And the conclusion so far is that the data is consistent with the presence of the, what is called least damped quasi normal modes, the most dominant quasi normal mode that we expect. But uh, if you want to be very, very sure, one has to have much more, much more accurate data that we have to, uh, to, to wait in the next several years. And, uh, but there has been some reanalysis of the data, independent real analysis data, using some more additional information, which are called um, considering multiple overtones of, of, of the, of the cosinormal modes. And the overtones are modes that decay at different time scales, different exponential de decay factor. 
and uh, which claims that we, you know, we do have evidence of cosmonomal modes in the data, etc. In any case, future observations, which we can hopefully observe with uh, much more signal-to-noise ratio, can do much more remarkable tests of the nature of black hole, in particular, what is called the Nohair theorem, which states that, according to GR, the black holes have only a small number of properties, like uh, their mass, their, their spin angular momentum, and an electric charge. So the entire properties of black holes can be described by these three hairs. There are no additional hairs of black holes. And, and, and one can actually verify this, this postulate of Nohair theorem uh, by measuring multiple quasi-normal modes, which uh, one is hopeful that we'll be able to do measure in the next uh, several years. Uh, finally, if we do have accurate models of of, of gravitational waves and alternative theories, one could make straightforward comparisons. So in a Bayesian language, what one could do is one could compute the posterior probability of the alternative theory with the posterior probability of GR. This is called the Bayesian odds ratio. And it's a very standard uh, um, data analysis process, which we're going to do. Uh, but currently, this is limited by the fact that we do not have accurate predictions of gravitational waves in, in, in many alternative theories. But theorists are on this problem. And there are very interesting ideas coming out to, to solve um, uh, these two-body problem in alternative theories, etc. So that's my summary. So we know that GR is a cornerstone of modern physics. It has passed all the experimental tests and observational tests with flying colors. But all these tests have been in the regime of weak gravity and, gravi and, and slow motions. And uh, gravitational observations have enabled, for the first time, tests of generativity in the regime of extreme gravity and extreme velocities. And so far, all the data is consistent with predictions of science theory. But currently, we are in the regime where we are dominated by the statistical uncertainties. But with more and more events and more and more loud events, we are going to do some, uh, we will be in a regime where one could do some precise tests of GR. And, and one also need to rely on a lot of theoretical, interesting theoretical work in prediction um, gravitational signals and alternative theories and uh, alternative to black holes also, exotic uh, compact objects also. So let me stop here. And I, I want to also suggest, uh, because of this lockdown, some, um, some reading material for you. And if you're interested in this uh, whole a uh, popular summary of some of these, these activities. There are some excellent books. One is by Clifford Will, which is, who is a you know, top expert in, in tests of GR and gravity. And this book is titled um, Was Einstein Right? Which is, oh, I stole as the title of uh, my talk. Um, it's a slightly older book, but still very, very relevant. There are some recent book by Daniel Kenefik, who is a, a renowned um, uh, historian of science, uh, apart from uh, relativistic himself. He's a former student of Kipton. Um, and one, of the, one is about this new book is about um, um, the um, um, Eddington's experiment that confirms the gravitational bending of light. This came only last year, a few months ago. And another is uh, the history of the gravitational waves itself, the quest for gravitational waves. It's called The Traveling at the Speed of Thought. And I, I strongly recommend all these books. And for the most, more advanced uh, 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 readers, uh, I also suggest few uh, reviews that, uh, that summarize the current status of the tests of GR using gravitational observations. So let me stop here, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Let me get to the questions. All right, so first question is why photon has to follow the curvature of space time. So first, it's an experimental fact that 
light travel through straight lines. And it's another experimental fact that um, the, well, and, and another fact that the shortest distance between two points in two in a curved space time is not a straight line, it's a curved space. And why does it have to do that? Uh, it can be seen by solving the Einstein's equations uh, itself. And um, so then you can see that basically photons follow what is called the null geodesics of space time um, by solving the Einstein's equations. You want to mathematically see it. Uh, the next question is, how does light travel through a gravitational wave? That's an interesting question. So gravitational waves itself also introduces a, a small curvature in space time. So uh, light also is redshifted by the gravitational wave itself, but that's a very small effect. Uh, it's practically immeasurable. Next is question is, again, uh, can a gravitational wave slow down the speed of light? Uh, again, the massive object space uh, slows down the speed of light. It, it, it's sort of speed of light in, in some sense. But again, the effect of gravitational waves is very weak. So it's practically immeasurable effect. Huh. So how do we, next is an interesting question, how do we distinguish between actual objects and gravitationally lensed objects? That's a very interesting question. So one has to rely on certain um, uh, spectral observations. So the idea is that what you will see from a strong gravitational lensing is that the mul you will see multiple images of the same source. And how do you identify them as the multiple in the same source? Because they would have the same spectral characteristic. They would have the same spectrum, they would have the same color, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, in, the, in, the, in the regime of um, strong lensing, where the mass scale of the lens is much larger as compared to the wavelength of the light or gravitation waves, uh, the lensing does not affect the frequency of these objects. So you could see the same. Um, Object same spectral characteristic at different locations in the space. That's how you identify it. Next is uh, do dark matter make gravitational waves? Everything makes gravitational waves. Any massive object that that, that has it that has an acceleration makes gravitational waves. If I'm moving my hand, I'm making gravitational waves. But the question is whether they are detectable. So if you want to make detectable gravitational waves. It requires the motion of massive and compact objects moving at speeds close to the speed of light. That's how black holes are the prime candidates. Dark matter is indeed massive, but it's not very compact typically. For example, you know that a galaxy is in a dark matter halo, and most of the mass of the galaxy is in the form of dark matter, but it's a much more diffuse system. So it's not a very compact uh, concentration. So even if you have a merger of galaxy, et cetera, the amount of gravitational waves that uh, it generates through the merger of the dark matter halo is rather small. So you need to have uh, you know, the right kind of detectors and the right kind of frequency bands to detect the, the, the gravitational waves made by dark matter or dark matter you know, mergers and so on, dark matter halos, etc. It's not possible currently, but one cannot say that it won't be possible in the future. So next is a question on the, the mass of the gravitons. So uh, I should first say that there is no quantum theory of gravity yet. There is no satisfactory theory of gravity, quantum gravity yet. So the idea of the graviton is only you know, uh, like a notional thing. So, but we know that just like the photon has no rest mass, um, because gravitational waves also travel the speed of light, which we have measured very experimentally as well as predicted by theory. The idea is that the corresponding quantum particle of, of, of gravity, which is a graviton, also has to be massless. So that's all I have now for questions. So I guess that's the end of the lecture.
thank you very much for listening and and take care